This week marks the 100th episode of ETF IQ. So to my partner in crime, Eric Bakshinis, congratulations. Likewise, I keep, time flies when you're having fun. Absolutely, we yeah. celebrated with some cupcakes, but let's celebrate with uh, check on flows too. Yes, I got a sugar rush going, which is perfect because I'm gonna about to go over flows. And it's fitting because the 100th uh, episode, the ETFs in the leaderboard are the old typical uh, ETFs you see when people are very excited. The ones we talk about almost every week, SPY, IWM, the Qs, HYG. The trading crowd is amped. What's gotten them amped? The trade deal? positive trade talks and also earnings. So you see a lot of money coming in. And what's fascinating about this is it's the exact opposite of what we saw last week. These four were all on the outflow leaderboard. Speaking of which, let's look at what is on the outflow leaderboard. And again, it's products that were on the inflow last week. So we've had a complete reversal. XLP is number one. That's the Staples ETF that people go to when they're feeling defensive. That was number two last week on the weekly flows. So if you're starting to sense like, hey, are, are, uh, uh, trading, is the trading crowd getting a little schizophrenic here? The answer is yes. And I can prove it with this chart of weekly flow volatility, which we sometimes break out just to show you um, how investors are a little um, uh, inconsistent. So you can see here the volatility of weekly flows is at its highest level since gasp Volmageddon, right? So this is probably Scarlet One takeaway from the otherwise really bullish sentiment is that this could end in a second. This, this is not a very committed type of uh, trading crowd right now. Yeah, pretty fleeting then, in other words. Let's bring in Ben Levine. He is CIO of 3D Asset Management and also Sarah Ponzek, a cross-asset reporter for Bloomberg News. Uh, Eric showed us the flows, and what got my attention, of course, was the last chart, the volatility in flows. There seems to be a lack of conviction right now owing to some pretty big overhangs. What do you think is the main narrative or narratives driving the market right now? Well, clearly, it's the two main narratives right now are China trade and Brexit. And we're actually starting to see, if not some near-term resolution, at least some uh, a pathway forward for both issues, and especially with Brexit. China, I think the bigger issue right now is whether the October tariffs get delayed or not, followed by December. And I think as long as the market senses that pr enough progress is being made uh, to at least delay those tariffs and prevent them from being imposed, that helps provide, I think, some uh, clearance for the markets to sort of reverse the August uh, Balmageddon mm. and, and resume their upward course. Sarah, let's bring you into the conversation because in terms of themes, you've been looking into sector leadership. What does history show us, especially with the S&P 500 kind of approaching its record high again. So if you look at leadership, recent leadership, and also over the past 12 months, it's really been driven by those defensive areas of the market. So real estate, utilities, staples, we've seen that in the flows as well. If you look at annual flows so far, that is really where we've seen the most demand. But if you look at history, typically if the S&P or stocks are going to really break out to new highs, that's typically not the leadership that you see. It's typically not completely driven by defensive areas of the market, and certainly not when the stock market is going to top out either. So that could actually give some people hope that there's been so much pessimism that maybe you have more room to run. And I just want to point out that if that is the case, you could see this reversion back to cyclical holdings, mm. cyclical outperformance. And if you've seen such a rush into these defensive areas of the market, you have to wonder if you're going to see a really quick reversal of that as well. I feel like we're constantly waiting for regime change or looking <laughs> for signs of regime change, Eric. Um, we talked about the U.S.-China trade deal. Uh, we also talked about Brexit. These are big international overhangs, but it's not really stopping people from going into international funds. Yeah, there was a huge trade, probably a model portfolio, I think, this is my theory. Two billion came out of VU, which is S&P, and about a billion went into IXUS and VXUS, which is the uh, uh, international XUS. Um, you like international. You find it to be a good trade right now, and you have uh, five ETFs that you like that we are about to show. And just talk about why you like that and which ETFs you're using. Um, I think it's more of a convergence trade. Um, certainly the fundamentals in the U.S. have justified the strong outperformance of the U.S. versus international markets. But at the margin, we're starting to see some good news now uh, being priced into international markets. Uh, with Japan, we're starting to see a rally following concerns about the imposition of, a, of an increase in their consumption tax. And in Europe, of course, we're seeing some potential resolution over Brexit. And then the macro numbers out of China are starting to turn around with uh, manufacturing sentiment, credit impulse, and so forth. So. Yeah, these things at the march, even with uh, manufacturing sentiment, particularly in Germany, still in the doldrums, we're starting to see some marginal good news get priced into the market. And I get the sense that uh, a lot of global asset allocators are sensing uh, that shift in sentiment. 
You know, we talk about believing in the U.S., the U.S. consumer, Sarah, that should argue for small caps doing well, but we know that uh, the trend of the small caps recovering ended before it really got started. What happened there? Right, so when you think about the outperformance in small caps that we did see back in September, remember that was really part of a larger trade where things that didn't work earlier in the year started to work. That included cyclicals, that included value, that included international countries as well. And we've seen that start to fade again. So if you actually look at the relative performance of the Russell 2000 versus the S&P, it's pretty much taken out all that outperformance we saw during that month. We've also seen inflows to IWM, the Russell 2000 ETF, really peter out because September was the strongest month for inflows since 2016, November, during the presidential election. And the problem is you can think of small caps as a macro play, a play on the U.S., but if you actually look at the fundamentals right now, they're just not there. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey sees a forecast of a decline, a contraction in earnings growth for small caps of 14% in the third quarter compared to a much smaller contraction for the S&P. And if you look at it on a yearly basis, the Russell 2000 is actually expected to see a decline in profits of roughly 4% across the year. So if you don't have the profits, if you don't have the fundamentals, it's hard for people to really get behind this trade. So, so Sarah just basically summarized Marianne Bartels, who was on. She did not like small caps, said go to large. But you're with Michael Burry uh, of the big short. He likes small caps, thought they were uh, forgotten by this whole beta vortex. Um, you use EES, too, which is an interesting selection. Why small caps and why EES? Well, Sarah has a good point in terms of pointing about uh, talking about the poor fundamentals that characterize small caps. Um, several um, strategists, particularly Mark Holbert, have noted that almost 40 percent of the Russell 2000 is operating at a loss. And, and so the earnings isn't there like what you saw in large cap. The reason why we think uh, smart beta or alternative indexing approaches to small cap make sense is because much of the small cap universe does trade uh, or, or currently has negative earnings. And mm -hmm. so we, th we like products like EES or, or dividend weighted uh, uh, strategies that focus on companies that are actually generating earnings, generating dividends and not operating at losses.